Hello and welcome to Movies, Films, and Flicks. I am Mark Hoffmeyer and joining me is a man who thinks it's unacceptable that chocolate makes you fat, but he's eaten his fair share. And guess what? It's Tom Tresemer. Chocolate is in the open. The list <laughs> is in the open. <laughs> right, I tried to figure out how to tie tie some Mission Impossible One into that opening with it. I don't know if I don't know if it's uh, the knock list is quite as devastating as chocolate, but it's up there. You have a wife. Do you have a girlfriend? Do you have a cat? Do you have a goldfish? Because I will find them, and I will kill you in front of them. Jeez Louise. PSH is crazy in this movie, man. Philip Seymour Hoffman. He's wonderful. He is wonderful. You know, I was just looking through, we're talking about Mission Impossible 3 today, and I was looking at the Mission Impossible franchise, and Mission Impossible 3 is by far and away the lowest grossing. It's the only one to make under $400 million in the franchise. And Mission Impossible 2 came out six years prior, and then Mission Impossible came out 10 years earlier, so those got to bump up with inflation. It's like, what? We like this movie. I like, I've spent so much... <laughs> Like for fandom, I had to do an entire Mission Impossible episode to figure out how far he ran, how far he hung, how many people he killed, how many times Chimera is said, how many times Rabbit's Foot is said. You know what's crazy? In this movie, the Rabbit's Foot is brought up 31 times, and Philip Seymour Hoffman mentions it three times in like the first minute. Where's the Rabbit's Foot? He got the Rabbit's Foot. But I've spent so much time with this movie, but this is kind of, do you think this is the, do you think two and three are the odd ones out of the franchise? Or is it just, what am I, I getting at here? It's, I think number two is the odd one out of the franchise. But it's John it. Woo. It's John. Like, do you like? Do you like two? No, I really don't. <laughs> I got the. I I took it downstairs, so I was watching, trying to watch some features. But I just recently got the the whole 4K run of the series, and two is by far and away. Like, if I never, I I I don't want to. Okay, I'll die on this hill. If I never watch two again, I'm probably fine with it. <laughs> oh. Like, it's just so standalone to everything else in the yeah. series. Like, for me, I can literally just go one, three, and then just watch the rest of it. Like, I don't have to watch two. And Chimera's brought two, up 30, it's, 30 times in that movie. It's too John Wooey for me. It oh, just I love doesn't, that. It, oh. it just doesn't mesh. For me, I, it just doesn't mesh with it. I love the melodrama. Like, I love Dugray Scott crying. Like, I love the long hair, slow motion knife almost in his... There's a motorcycle fight in it. And there it's is. Just, it's like... With I, slow motion birds behind them the entire time. Oh, it's so good. And just... It, and it's, it's just evil. too... Oh, man. It's just what? too... It's too visually... I don't know. I love I love silly, crazy visuals like that. But it, uh, it just doesn't fit in the series anymore. Do you know why I like Tom Cruise, though, is when he joined up for... the mission impossible he let De palma make a De palma movie when he joined up for mission impossible 2 he let john woo make a john woo movie when he signed up for mission impossible 3 he let jj abrams make a jj abrams movie it's pretty cool that he brings people in and or used to and let them make their own movie like I, that's a respect like a, a thing of respect to him but i you know i like three a lot uh, but i think two is just an odd duck and it's john wooey so I don't know, but I enjoy all these films. And I, I remember being super excited for this one because of Carrie Russell. <laughs> uh -huh. Like Watching Action Russell, I was so happy to see that. Well, and she was just coming off of her, her like Felicity stardom. I don't remember when Felicity ended. I think it was just shortly before this movie. But it's like she was pretty big time. Like that was a smart move to bring in a TV audience for this. And it's yeah. like she she does well in this too. Like she went through several months of weapons training and she kicks but unfortunately limited screen time. Like I would have been happy to have her throughout the entire movie, but like what she does, those scenes that she's in, I think she steals them. Yeah, no, she really does. And just just the way she shot the physicality. Like I, I really love that about them. But yeah, it's this is this this one i guess for me this this is gonna sound crazy tom i love all these movies so me saying this doesn't mean i dislike this one because i've watched this more than 10 times like this one's probably my least favorite because i get kind of tired of the whole i'm gonna go domestic but then of course my wife gets kidnapped like it's it's good i think the beginning has a lot of stakes when he's begging for his life I like when he knocks down that little bin and like gives away his his location. I love the running scenes. Like when Carrie Russell's eye blows up 
like that hits. I like the team, Jonathan Reese Myers, Maggie Q. They don't really have much to do, but I like them. Uh, but like the whole point where Luther's like, hey, man, like we're lonely beasts and it's going to, you know, your lies are just going to fester. Why am I giving him a southern accent? But yeah, it's. Yeah. You're channeling I, your like <laughs> your Con Air. Yeah. <laughs> diamond dog yeah. as best as you can. But then but then she gets kidnapped and it's like, I'm going to kill her. And if you don't get, get here, you, you called me with 0.5 seconds left and she's going to die in two hours. And and. I don't know. That whole trope is just so tired. I feel like the whole domesticated thing. Again, I don't. I'm trying to think of films that happened before 06 with that. Uh, I mean, like you get Mr. You and Mrs. Daughter with, uh, you know, like True Lies and stuff like that. You know, you get the family stuff with some of Schwarzenegger's movies. But it's like I feel like the guy trying to step away and retire came after mission impossible three so it's like in my mind i've got to remind myself like you know this came out in 2006 you know taken if i can remember off the top of my head it's like oh eight then you've got john wick which was a few years after that still so it's like all these other movies are they not stealing more from mission impossible three than i mean i don't think the kidnapped wife i mean like there's so many people who are kidnapped i feel like in most 80s movies the woman's always grabbed and then they got to go save her and like it's just i don't know and then the beginning when he's reading lips and it's supposed to be charming it's like hey man you're like listening in on conversations that you shouldn't be listening in on it's, it's just i've watched every tom cruise movie three times since 2017 every single one of them uh for three different articles one for let's see i did one for rotten tomatoes i did one for two for fandom and so like i think there's a way to make tom cruise really charming and that's jerry Maguire and movies like that not in this one. I don't know. The domesticated Tom Cruise just kind of staring and like looking into people's souls in the beginning. It's never worked for me, but I like the action stuff. I like the team stuff. I like oh, Luther scuba diving. Like I like that he can, he's like T minus two minutes. And then he's, he has enough time to break into something like cut an entire hole in the steel plate and get his computer up in two minutes. Like, I love that. Like I, I like the That's Italy scene. Like when Jonathan Reese Myers is yelling Italian at people, like I love that, but just his domestic life. Cause here's the thing. You know, well, they show it in the beginning, but like you, like, you know, she's getting kidnapped. So it's like, okay, she like, I don't know. Like, I, I guess for me, there's really, it's like, oh, they brought her in to have her kidnapped. And that's, that's like a plot point that I don't know. All these movies have MacGuffins. Benji gets kidnapped. Luther gets kidnapped. Everybody gets kidnapped in these movies. But well, it, I, I don't know. I wrote that's this one down. Movie. Because I actually love, one, I love the whole opening scene. I love how it starts, like, midway through the movie. Like, you get the most intense scene right at the very beginning of the movie. And then you just see how evil Owen Davian is. Mm -hmm. And this, the, I don't know, man, and that's just some good acting in that scene right there. You know, the, the whole hostage scene for, for the people that are following along. And then the circle back, I really enjoy the party scene like the early domestic life of ethan hunt like this would be like i feel like i don't know if i'm trying to rationalize it two was so insane that he just <laughs> had to get away like he just realizes like this is a never-ending cycle it's going to repeat forever so it's like they've offered me a training job to drain the next you know the next branch of imf agents and so that's what he does and he ends up finding jewels Michelle Monaghan, Iowa shout out. Yeah, she's from Iowa, so I gotta gotta throw that in there. And you're a Kiss Kiss Bang Bang fan too, aren't you? I am. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a good movie. But like, I love the scene because it like it makes me think of like how a superhero, like you see, like the Marvel DC, like how they would interact with normal people and how hard they have to try to dial it back. So it's like he's doing the best he can to blend in with just the average citizen, but he just can't help it. Like he's literally just like mixing some cocktails and just across the room, he sees them chatting and he can't help himself, but to read some lips. And then he tries to find like the most like subtle way, like to outlet that and get that out of him. And so that's when he sh throws out the, the wake water, uh, Watica. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. You know, when he's reading the lines, but like, I just like his interactions and he's trying to make himself boring 
And then you've got the uh, oh my gosh, what's its name? The actor J.J. Abrams Gutfeld. always bring yes. Wait, no, not yeah. Greg Gutfeld. That's like a late night host. That's a Greg... late night host for wait, Fox just a second, just a second. I hate that guy. Greg Gunn. Just, just a second. Uh, wait, let me let me read. I'm Gunnenberg. gonna get rid of that. Let me. Put... Just... I have it here. Give me five seconds. Grunberg. Greg Grunberg. Grunberg. Okay, here we go. Do Greg you want to jump back? Do you want to jump back into it? I like that guy. Yeah. So, I'm trying to think. So J.J. Abrams has that uh, that guy he brings with him, like in every single project, uh, Greg Grunberg. And what sticks to me in that party scene is is Ethan Hunt's talking about his you know, his DOT work, and you know he's like super into it, and like he's literally selling it, pitching his fake job, and everyone's just eating it up. But then, like, the men in the room, you can tell, like, they're intimidated, but they go so far with it where they're, like, snooze fest, the guy's boring. But then all the women are like, yeah, we'd marry him. Like, I don't know. I I find that stuff, I find that whole scene really, really fun. And then especially, like, you boil it down more to, like, the actors that are actually in that scene. Like, it's kind of crazy. Like, you got a young Aaron Paul walking around, mm -hmm. Sasha Alexander from Resilient Isle, like, you got some good faces that are just like randomly in this party scene with Ethan Hunt that you wouldn't think. No, no, I mean, it is a stack cast and it, listen, it's fine. I guess just the whole point it's like, I don't know, speed too, right? She gets kidnapped as well. Jeez Louise. 94 is big on kidnapping, but it, it, I don't know. You just, it's just a setup. It's all a setup. Like it doesn't feel organic to the story which I mean, it rarely is, but it's like they only brought her in to get her kidnapped. And then, I mean, you just know it's coming. So I think it and then you have Luther telling him that's not good. It's just an odd point for me. It's never really sat right because like, here's this cool character, good actor. The only reason this is happening so she can get kidnapped and tortured by PSH. I don't I'm going to push back <laughs> on you. I'm pushing back. I Again, like how the movie starts off, like, you know, she's going to get kidnapped. That's a given because of the interrogation mm -hmm. execution scene to start the movie off. But to me, I don't know. I think it does flow organically because it's like Philip Seymour Hoffman's Owen Davian. He's all business. And it's like, I think you said he only mentions the rabbit foot three times. It's everyone else that's up in arms about it. Like to him, it's just business. That's all there is. He doesn't take things. I mean, yeah, he does eventually take things personally, but it's like you have to really push his buttons to do it. And it's like Cruz kidnapping him, laying hands on him, and then threatening to like drop him out of an airplane. You know, he just pushed him a little too far. And like that whole scene was supposed to be Ethan Hunt interrogating the bad guy, and it ends up turning out and like Owen Davian might be the only villain in the entire series that does this, like completely flips the script on Ethan Hunt and out hunts Hunt. <laughs> and so if, like, and then somehow he hears, you know, who his name is. And like, in my mind, like that's when things become personal. Like up until then, it's a cat and mouse game. Like everything is business. I'm selling something bad. You're trying to stop me. I get it. But then you just threaten to drop me out of a plane. Now it's getting personal. Now I'm going to light your world up. And then from there, like in the whole grand scheme of the series, like that sets everything. And I, I, I don't know if this is what they were, how they had a plan, you know, five years later is when, when ghost protocol came out, but it's like without Jules getting kidnapped, we theoretically wouldn't have these other movies because hunt, you know, was trying to protect her. And so that is literally what gets him back out in the field and drives him for the next almost 20 years now since this movie without that you know he may be back in virginia working his fake dot job and you know the world would have ended five times already i just you're right L listen i do like this but for me when i enjoy the mission impossible movies most in the, in the first movie right you have the the langley scene where he's hanging there and he can't breathe he can't do anything but then a rat comes out <laughs> and you know, Jean Reno has to deal with this rat while holding a guy. Like, I think Mission Impossible exceeds when you have problems on problems. And I, I, I love when that happens. Like in Ghost Protocol, there's a sandstorm. The eye thing doesn't work. The masks break. Like, I love when they build, like every single one of those movies has a problem on a problem. And he just has to solve them. 
But in this one, his problems come because in in this one, he decides to settle down. They grab one of the worst like villains on the planet. He's like, I'm going to get your girlfriend. I'm going to get your wife and I'm going to kill her. And then Luther goes, Ethan, no. And he's like, well, now I know your name. So now he knows his name. And then they grab his wife. Like it's, it's, I don't know. I, I like it when problems are added on problems, but these ones, they kind of cause their own problems for themselves. And maybe that's how characters learn. Like I can't do this again and I can't get back into this again, but I don't know. It, I'm telling you, man, like, it, like they did that in alias for years where she pretends to have boyfriends, but then they're dead or then they're, you know, they disappear. And then she dates the guy at work. And it just felt like I had seen it before with like alias and all of that. But I don't hate this movie. I like Maggie Q. I like John. Are you Lee sure? Myers. No, but I, you know, it's, it's, it's fine to like a movie and, and enjoy it. I've watched this movie way too many times and I wouldn't have, you know, I brought, I wanted to talk about this movie because I feel like it's actually interesting to talk about. Like there's so many movies out there that are just good and you really struggle. The one thing I found out during a podcast, you know, we're 500 episodes and hosting Deep Blue Sea is there's some movies that are just good. And there's really nothing wrong with them. And those movies are really hard to talk about because they're just fine. Like there's no, there's no sticking points. And I think this one has something that can be debated and can be looked at, but still enjoyed. And you can appreciate Tom Cruise being shot into a car, Tom Cruise flying down the Vatican wall by himself. Like you can really appreciate excellent stunts. And you, you watch the behind the scenes. There's like two and a half hours of extras. I listen to the commentary. They put a lot of work in this. They put a lot of care into this. Tom Cruise is like, will put his body on the line. Like he, he, he said one thing. He's like, yeah, that one really rattled my molars. And like his running down the buildings and then sprinting a thousand feet. Like those are physical, incredible acts. And Kerry Russell's death and Philip Seymour Hoffman and just how awesome he looks on that helicopter when it's going away. But like there's two scenes where he's chained down and people leave him alone and he escapes. Like there's two, like that's just... I don't know. It's it's a movie that I both really enjoy, but it also I think it takes me out of the most of all of them. Even though MI2 is insane, it still takes me out a little bit more than I would like because they just like, hey, let's strap this guy down, but let's not watch him. Like, let's handcuff him and leave him. Like, it's, I don't know. There, there's... <sighs> you, do you so see you what I'm getting you... at? No. <laughs> because I just <laughs> disagree. I, I don't... It no, it's not. It's not a perfect movie, but no, no, N and nothing is. Like I just did an R-rated data post. I, I like pulled the data on a thousand movies, and like what? Only one percent of movies pass the Hoffmeyer scale of like score excellence. So, you, you know, it's not perfect, and but it, and I still enjoyed it. It still made four hundred million dollars, but it just doesn't. I don't know. It, it's not my favorite Mission Impossible movie. I don't know. For me, I think this was also the time that it came out. It was such a difficult movie because it's like it's coming right off the the huge success of the born trilogy which came out in what two 2001 two and three so like yeah. successive years and then you get the whole reboot of james bond with casino royale which was huge and critically acclaimed so it's like four movies right there the spy genre that are more or less trying to take over what mission impossible was doing so it's like in my mind, this was like the reboot of the new direction they needed to go with this series to oh, keep up with them. 100%. And I, and I don't know. I, I don't have anything against no. like any of the story, the plot points of kidnapping. Again, like I feel like you've got to get him. I think 2 was such a... <laughs> well, it's Notorious. It's a remake of Hitchcock's Notorious. And it's... Yeah, and it's like it was not critically acclaimed audiences were pretty pretty polarized by it so it's like they had to go a different direction and it was it was a pretty long layoff between them what it was six years between between two and three the number one one and two was four four years now to be between, fair though six years that's like that's he a did, big gap he did vanilla sky and then he did minority report last samurai collateral and war of the worlds so he was he was throwing some heaters except for vanilla sky like Minority Report, Last Samurai, Collateral, and War of the Worlds. Like he was, he was Pete Cruz, I think, at this moment, probably. Yeah. Like, uh, again, Pete Cruz. He's had several peaks in his career, but this was like peak Cruz, I would say. 
Yeah, but they they definitely had some pre-production issues go on. They had at least two, maybe three different directors depart over mm -hmm. creative differences. So I feel like he would have taken this sooner if they could have gotten everything lined up and got it going. But it's like they had uh, David Fincher at one point attached to it. <laughs> uh, is it Joe Carnahan? Am I saying his name right? Yeah, Carnahan. Uh, my my big A team guy. Like he he left the show. And like they went through like completely different script rewrites. Like they had they had everything like cast and ready, and then directors leave. So they're literally hitting the reset button to get this going again. So I mean, it's you know that for people that don't know, that happens a lot in Hollywood. Uh, but yeah, it was just such a transitional time when this was going on. And yeah, it was. I mean, this was this was Pete Cruz, and unfortunately, when stacked up against his other movies, it may not hold as much water to. I love Last Samurai. That's a fantastic movie. And Minority Report's one of my all-time favorites, too. Collateral is my probably Collateral's my second fantastic. favorite Cruise performance. It's his best sitting performance. That's for sure. So it's... Listen, and I, they, I think it, maybe it's good they got delayed because the Bor Born Identity hit, Born Ultimatum hit. Like, they're like, oh, crap. Like, this is the direction that it's going. And even... You know what's nice is even though those movies were hitting, they still didn't do all the editing that those films were doing. They still weren't as manic as the Bourne movies are. There are some elements to it, but it was still very, very Mission Impossible focused on the mm -hmm. stunts that Ethan was going to pull off. And so, you know, like I love, listen, I love the character of Ethan Hunt. There's a scene where he's figuring out the math to jump from building to building in Shanghai. And his entire crew was like, you can't do this. You can't do this. And he's like, listen, guys, I have two hours and I got to save my wife. Just help. Stop telling me no. I'm going to do this. Like, I like that. I, I, I like when like, I, I like how, it, how he's driven. I love the character of Ethan Hunt and what he's become. Quick question. You're, you're, you're Philip Seymour Hoffman, right? You're Davian. And Ethan Hunt has, is like, I have the rabbit's foot. And you're like, okay, well, I have your wife. Come to me. You pick him up in a stretch limo. And in a glass, you have a vial of something. You have no plans on knocking him out, but you just want him to drink something funky and like give him a weird rat. Like, like, so it's not like a sleeping potion you're giving him. You're giving him any beverage, but he's not expecting it. Like, what would you do to surprise Ethan Hunt? He's not going to get knocked out. He's just going to take a sip of it and be like, what? Like nothing gross, <laughs> like a real edible beverage. I was thinking gin great... because like, That's hey, shoot this. Question. Like, because there's a there's, there was a movie where a uh, TV show where this person brought shots and everyone did the shots and it was gin. And she's like, no one expects gin. Like, I love gin, but I don't shoot it. It's like he's sitting in the back and he just shoots a quick gin shot. He's like, what? Like, that's that's what I would do. I would do gin. I don't I think it depends on my state of mind. Uh, Owen Davian is so. It has to be edible, though. evil. I could see him doing something like straight hard prune juice like <laughs> just something really thick and in my mind just gross i've tried drinking prune juice a few times for the health benefits and i just cannot get around to it and it leaves such an awful aftertaste in my mouth or you can go completely opposite of that and something sweet like a shot of hawaiian punch breathing is like, <laughs> like what? oh my god Ecto what is what is going on? What is going to happen here? Yeah, like he would hate that because he, he doesn't do much sugar. So he's like, oh, man, I got sugar. I'm going to crash soon. That's his yeah. adrenaline shot. Instead of taking it, <laughs> taking it to the heart like Kerry Russell, he's uh, he's doing his his Hawaiian punch shot before uh, mission. I would do gin. I just think gin would be kind of funny because he's like, what? Gin? And then the guy opens the window again and goes like Hendrix. And then he pulls it back up. And then you have Hendrix product, product placement in the movie. And he's like, there's a second one in the mini bar if you need it. <laughs> Hunt gets out and he's just snockered on gin. <laughs> That'd probably be like the only way I could make it through. Yeah. But, you know, also, too, this is the one movie where you have the angry boss. You know, like, I, like, like, I love fish. A fish burn. They call him fish in the commentary. Everyone calls him fish. In the Event Horizon commentary, fish. In this commentary, fish but yeah tom cruise is like i've known fishburn since we were teenagers and it which is kind of crazy and like it's just the angry boss and you know he's not bad you know crudup is bad the entire time and it i don't know this one just it i like it i just kind of you always know where it's going i knew crudup was bad i knew she would get kidnapped 
Like I knew from the beginning, they tell you that. Like I just, you know, like I don't know. It just felt like a movie where you like when when he starts crawling on that building in Mission Impossible Four, I was not ready for the the visceral thrill of it. Like this, the the ex the scope of the shot in Mission Impossible when he's just hanging there. Like I never expected to feel so tense with him just typing in and dealing with floppy disks. You know, in Mission Impossible Two, I was like, "There's a motorcycle fight." Like and his hair is just flowing in the wind, and Do Gray Scott is crying. Like there's there's fun surprises to be had with these movies, and I guess I just didn't have any fun surprises with MI3, and I just consider it to be a really cromulent fun action film. In the words of Norbert Morvan, uh, I don't. I guess I just maybe it's because JJ was a relatively new director. I mean, he's not Wu or De Palma, so I mean, it's and this un- was his this was his feature film yeah, debut. This was, and you know, it's unfair to to kind of put that on him but yeah, i just don't it doesn't have the personality of the first two it it, it just felt very stock to me and that's fine because i've watched it a lot i just never thought that it i'd rather watch something bonkers like mission impossible 2 than something like mission impossible 3 because i'm like i, I if it was on cable i'd probably rather watch mission impossible 3 but 2 is just so funky and I, I admire it for it. I, I guess, you, I don't know, you're probably going to say no when I say, do you know what I'm saying? But no. I just, <laughs> no. I, do, do, you, do, you think this, do you think this is kind of the most stock of all the Mission Impossible films? I, I think, I don't, I don't know if I can, I think Mission Impossible 2 is like the most stock of stock action movies. Whoa. I just, man, I do not like, I do not like Mission Impossible 2. It the more the, I talk about it, the more heated I get on it. It has one of the mean, it has the meanest Tom Cruise, uh, Ethan Hunt moments when he dresses that guy up and puts tape over his mouth and puts a Tom, uh, Ethan Hunt mask over him and then mm-hmm. just watches him die and get killed. And like, it's such a brutal moment. Like he, he kills a guy in cold blood and just watches him with these glazed eyeballs. And I love it so much. So it's, I just, I feel like that's why it's the outlier. Like, it's just so different than all the others. And they made a fantastic choice when they went away from that style. Like, it was just, it was going to turn into, uh, oh, my, what what's the, the director that does Monster Hunter? Why am I? No, Paul W. Sanderson. Yes, it was turning into, like, that obscene type of action in my mind. Oh, wait, but that was, is John Woo action? John Woo invented that action. Yeah. But it's like, it was just, I don't know. I just don't think that type of action goes well with the Mission Impossible and what they're trying to be. So, all right, here's what, here's, here's a, a take that I, I'm, I'm going to go for it. I'll, I'll die on this <laughs> hill. The new, the Mission Impossible series from one to, what is it, seven now, they are what Fast and the Furious wants to be, but they just don't quite get there like they want the sexy women the cars the shootouts all these crazy stunts but they push it just a little too far in the wrong direction a little too far over the top where they don't ever ground it there's nothing to come back to and it just keeps going up and up and up and up and up and granted i haven't seen i haven't seen fast 10 so i don't know i can only assume that it, it just gets even nuttier than everything else i would say i would say the movie stay relatively grounded with paul walker's presence like paul walker was the guy brian o'connor was the guy who grounded the franchise like you know fast five with the robbery it's very low stakes six it's still quite grounded i know it gets bonkers with the tank but they're still that they're still overmatched in that Seven is when things get crazy, but that one made over a billion dollars and it has some yeah. fun. It has some very fun, like when they're driving through the buildings, those are some standout things. But in that scene, Brian O'Connor's like, we can't do this. Like, we're not doing this. Like, stop. So he's, I think, and when he defeats Tony Ja, like it's, it's, he over, like he was being beaten up and then he won after being steamrolled the first time. And then he's the one who has to escape the truck with the help of Michelle Rodriguez. So I think 
with his presence, it or jumping grounded. buildings in that. Yeah, in that. And like, but he's in the passenger. Ferrari. But he's in the passenger seat, going, "This is not good. Like, we can't do this." So I, I guess what and I'm saying eight, is, eight, there's nine, a and ten get crazy though. Eight, nine, there's and ten a difference go. between having a character trying to keep it grounded. And again, like I love that action. I love the fast, the fast series. I guess what I'm trying to point out is that I, I think the action, I don't there. It's just it's almost to the point where you know there's absolutely no way anyone could ever survive that. Like the physics just go out the window. But with the Mission Impossible, like all that stuff, albeit the chances of survival are very low, are still possible. Like they, those events can't not exist impossible? on this plane of reality. Like it would not surprise me if there are these crazy electronic gloves that help you climb a skyscraper. Mm-hmm. And like that's your point. Like yeah, that that technology falters and it fails. <laughs> you know, midway through his attempt up. The, I love problems the, on problems. Of uh, oh, what is it? The Baj Khalifa. Yeah, so yeah, the, the building tallest called. building in the world. Yeah, the bird. Like, yeah, right yeah. So it's like that stuff is. In my mind, it's still very plausible, but like that's where the Mission Impossible series gets me. It's like these events are absolutely insane, but there is still the possibility you could live through that with Mission Impossible 2 being the outlier. Like <laughs> that movie is just so far out there, but I think three is what brings it back. Like three is what, yeah. from, in my mind, starts it at what it eventually becomes and that's why i i love it especially in the grand scheme of the entire series i like the fallibility of ethan hunt as well i love when he escapes with the rabbit foot and then smashes into that building but then the wind pulls his parachute back out like that's probably my favorite moment of the movie and also he dies like michelle monaghan julia has to bring him back in fast oh not fast in Ghost Protocol, he's, his foot is caught. He is saved. In 6, Elsa has to bring him back to life after drowning. So I like that he's a guy who, he dies, <laughs> and women have to save him. Okay, and- wait, so so maybe maybe Michelle Monaghan had to be introduced, the wife had to get kidnapped to save Cruz, because he was going to get that nose implant, that brain implant, and she's the only one that can bring him well, back. I love that moment. And when he takes his, the stick out of his mouth and says, I love you, that's a really neat little moment. And it's a nice, you know, we already know what the thing does because it blew up Carrie Russell's brains. So it's a it's smart filmmaking in that regards. And that's where I like the movie. I just think what the problem with the movie is I just, you know, I remember watching Rogue Nation. I'm like, where is this going? Like, what? this is crazy. And I, I remember, you know, Dead Reckoning is probably not my favorite, but. I didn't know where it was going. Like I, I, I was just along for the ride. This is the only one where I felt. But you know what? Like the nice thing about all the Mission Impossible movies, and I think what makes Cruise a very smart creator. I mean, I say this a million times. Like Top Gun Maverick, they talk about the mission for an hour, then they go on the mission, so you know the mission. In these Mission Impossible movies, it's like, okay, we're breaking into Langley. This is what we need to do. Okay, we're breaking in this facility. This is what we need to do. Okay, we're gonna go to Shanghai. We're gonna do this. We're gonna do that. We're going to do this. Like, I like that, you know, I like that they explain the missions. So when they go on the missions, you can just enjoy the mission because they've already explained it. I'm not talking about that in regards of knowing where it's going. I just felt like a, it was, it was, it's, it just feels like the most stock plotting of it. Plot wise. Yeah. You, yeah. you knew what was happening. Yeah. But like, I love that they explain the mission. So like, that's brilliant. Like, I think that's smart because it's like, Hey, this is what the mission is. So when they're on the mission, they don't have to explain it. You know, you watch a movie like inception, which I love. But they have to explain that movie. I covered on the podcast and I realized that that movie entire film is explaining things to people. It's crazy. Like It's it's 90 percent of it's telling someone what's happening. So it's kind of nice to not have that and just watch the action because it's already been explained to you. And, you know, I have two hours to get the rabbit's foot. So like, I think for audience sake, it's really easy to just sit back and enjoy these movies because you know exactly what the mission is. So you can enjoy the mission. You can enjoy him on the side of a wall and he doesn't have to explain things. But it, it, it's just, yeah, I mean, I, my, that's my main complaint. I'm, I've said it a billion times, Tom. I, I love a lot about this movie, but it's just, it's the one film that lacks any surprise for me. And Well, and it's, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. 
and the and the friends that you make along the way of that and, journey. And like the best moments are the the funny post. Like I love when he's like, I love you when he takes the thing out of his mouth. Like I love when Maggie Q goes, but it's such a nice car. Like I I like when they're in the car and he's like, Hey, how you guys doing? And Philip Seymour Hoffman's like, Good man, just having a bud. What's, like, what's yeah. up? No, what's <laughs> up with you? Nothing. Yeah. Just being super chill. And I I like the the you know when Tom Cruise gets pulled out of the building by the parachute, there is a personality to it. And those are the moments when its personality shines is when I like it the most. But it I agree. It, I agree with that. It's it I don't know. I just like I love on Ghost Protocol when he's on the side of the building and everyone's telling him what's happening. He's just and he's just like, no shit. <laughs> like he he's like, stop. <laughs> like I that's when I like Ethan Hunt. So you know, I, I just you knew his life of domestic bliss wasn't going to last. You knew that like you knew they were going to make another one after this one. And, and then like when they go back to ghost protocol, they just did a hard reset, which kind of negated a lot of what three does. And that's not three's fault, but yeah, it just seems two and three are that little kind of what one, two and three, which is, pretty much the Fast and Furious movies as well. One, mm-hmm. two, and three. And I guess I would say four. And then five, everyone's like, oh, start at five. Like, I guess with the, these, I love the first three, but then Ghost Protocol is when it started making Buku bucks. Like, Ghost Protocol made $694 million at the box office. And then Rogue Nation made 688 Fallout made 786 And then Dead Reckoning made 566 But yeah, it, I think Ghost Protocol kicked it into the, it perfected the format. I think. Well, and I think some of this too is the is the supporting cast with it. Like I love I love his team in number three. Number two, he didn't from my recollection. There's no team, yeah. There's not really anybody. It's him carrying the weight of literally everything. I mean you've get you've got Thandy Newton, but she's more of a damsel in distress through most of that movie. One, you have his team, but not for very long. Like I would have loved to see, and I know I remember at one point they were talking about trying to make a prequel to Mission Impossible One, kind of like exploring that team and like oh. Emilio Estevez. Like that is the movie I would have loved to see. Like I like One, but like his team is gone. They're one dead. features my favorite they're, team though, Jean Reno. Jean Reno, Ving Rhames. Like I love that team in the first uh, Emmanuel uh, beer. Like I love that first team in it. Like there's that scene where they're in a fire truck. This all sitting together, looking stylish as hell. Like I, I love, and they're on the train, that first train conversation between them. Like, yeah. That's, that's my favorite team. And uh, actually I rank the teams. You want to, you want to know how I rank the teams? I, I do. Okay. So I'm going to say mission impossible. 96 is number one. And then I'm going to take ghost protocol because I really like Paula Patton, Jeremy Renner, Simon Pegg. You know, they, they lost Luther, but I like that dynamic between all of them. And I like Paula Patton's. Paula Patton has an arc in the movie, which I enjoy. And I like Jeremy Renner in it as well. Then I would probably say Rogue Nation because you bring back Luther you bring, and you bring in Elsa. Like, she's awesome. Then I would say Mission Impossible 3 because I don't know. I like Jonathan Reese Myers and Maggie Q in this movie. They have nothing to do. They have one moment alone when he's like, tell me it. Like you tell they they have that little scene. Yeah, and then her little her little prayer for her cat. Probably Fallout next. And Fallout and then Dead Reckoning. And then last but not least, Mission Impossible 2. Cause you know, they just got that dude in a helicopter and Ving Rames and Tom Cruise. But I mean, I like them all. I just I don't know. But this there's something about three that I like. They're just in here for a little bit. Like Maggie Q could come back. I don't know. Like Jonathan Reese Myers had a lot of issues and he's doing better now, but I don't know why she doesn't come back. I don't know why Paula Patton doesn't come back. Like maybe they don't need to, maybe they don't want to work with Cruz again, but it just seems odd that these characters have never been back, but I do I, like I, the team. Yeah. I, that's always been one of my big problems. I mean, I think it's format wise, story wise. It, it makes a lot of sense to mix the teams up like Luther being a staple in it. I mean, he does very specific special things. I mean, he's he's in the know, van he's the a compu- lot. Yeah, he's the computer. He's the van guy. And it's like, how many van guys does IMF really need? Uh, <laughs> Simon Pegg is the other you know, van guy. Becoming a a field agent, but I mean, he's like like he's their 
oh what it what is he he's not he's not an analyst per se but he's like their their technology dude like he's you know he can decrypt the hard drives like how many hard drive guys do you really need so it's like those guys rolling over from mission to mission makes much more sense than having another jeremy renner or another <laughs> yeah. maggie q or you know jonathan reese like those guys are like the high risk people that you wouldn't expect to live long just in that field of work. Like they are all, they are all kind of like minor Ethan hunts to an extent. Like I can almost see them having their own leading their own teams at some other point. Yeah, that's true. It but just sucks I, that they helped him find his wife. Like without them, his wife probably wouldn't have been saved. Mm hmm. So you feel no, like he would, I, they would have a special place in his heart, but, but this, like, you know, they brought in Jeremy Renner to take over for Cruz because Cruz wasn't exactly on a heater when he did ghost protocol. So when he did ghost protocol, he had, he was done with, he had done Valkyrie and night and day and lions for lambs and a little bit, a uh, bit roll in Tropic thunder. So, but then all of a sudden he blew up again and they're like, all right, we'll keep We'll just lose runner for fallout and not even bring him back in dead. Right. So they offered Renner to come back and die. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. Is that what it was? I thought he had scheduling conflicts. Or no, something else. Uh, in the commentary, I, li I listened to it and Macquarie was like, yeah, we offered him to come back and get killed. And then he's, and then he said, good on him. He didn't accept it. So, oh no, that would suck. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think that's a I spite think, move right there. I think ghost protocol is probably my favorite team of everyone. And again, it's because of Renner and Paula Patton. They're just badass. And Isn't she? Like, she has a story. Finally... And, and, and also, like, Ghost Protocol is the first movie in the series that really gets big into the physical combat. Like, yes, there's the fight scene in three between Philip Seymour Hoffman and, and Cruz. But, like, Cruz, he's got a detonator about to explode in his head. Like, he can't really fight. So he's punching with his elbows. And rolling around, just kind of doing whatever he can. Like, that's more of just complete mayhem brawl. But it's like four is like the first time where you really see like their true combative martial arts skills. And it's like Paul Patton and Jeremy Renner both do that really, really well. And then it carries over to Rogue Nation. And then you, you get you get Elsa mm -hmm. introduced. Oh, and then she's so good. From there on out, like everything is like the, the fight scenes have really been ratcheted up, which I appreciate. I love the, I love fight scenes, but like three kind of started the trend four is where they picked it up and it's continued. I like, so I like in four when Paula Patton kills Leah Sado because she's not supposed to, but she's like, yo, you killed my, you killed my partner. And she just kicks her out of a she building. She's out a window, man. It's awesome. And, and then, you know, she has to come through. Like she has to like make her, she gets hurt and like done that. But I, I think that's probably the first and like Renner has a story and I, I, I like that they have like even Benji's new in the field and he has to kind of step up like there's a good character development in four where I think that I, I kind of feel bad for Maggie Q and John three Myers because they have zero they're more just there to look cool and they do look cool they look great they look like, very cool like, while looking cool yeah like they, they look wonderful and like Colleen Atwood who's one of the greatest costume designers of all time did that that dress for Maggie Q. And I did a thing for, let's see, I did a thing for um, fandom where I did like Mission Impossible movies by the, by the numbers and they love leg shots. So like in the third one, she steps out the car and there's a leg shot. And then you have the leg shot of Ilsa. And then you have the leg shot of Vanessa, Vanessa Kirby. Like they go hard on leg classy leg shots. I, like, so don't do butt shots like fast and furious. And I had to count all those too, but they they do the classy such legs. a shame for you. I'm yeah, sorry. They do you all the, go through that. They do all the classic uh, they do classy leg exposure in the Mission Impossible movies. But so Tom, you're talking to me. I don't hate this movie. I just think it's the one with the most predictable plotting. And that's that doesn't mean I don't like it. I just I don't know. So I, would <clears throat> So is the opening scene its own worst enemy then? Well, no, you, you know, no, no, exact, you know, you exactly that. what's going to happen. You need that because the, like, it doesn't start hot. Like you need these movies to start hot. You need to start with the action. Remember the first one, the second one, you need to start with an action scene. He's climbing on a rock. The plane crashes, you know, like 
you can't just start at a party and then slowly build to him getting the team, him going so on. A, like you got to start, you got like, they raised it first, but I would have known since day one, if he had a spouse, like, Oh, okay. That's going to be a problem later. So it's, I, I, I don't think that hurts it at all. So that's interesting though, because I feel like it's four onward that starts with these amazing action scenes so I'm, oh my gosh now i'm trying because one play. one what? has the guy in the room right and he's dying and they got yeah but that's, but that's more, a De Palma movie though that but it still ratchets it up right because you yeah, have a guy it's more in a room a thrilling and, a yeah. thrilling moment and then two's like dun, 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 and like the plane crashes and people die and it's not Cruz and he's on a mountain and he yep. gets oakley's and when biscuits playing and then three you need that because otherwise it's just the party yeah so but three, three might have like the most, I don't know. Was it, one and three probably Hoffman's... have the most, the most grounded intros. Yeah. And like PSH is great. Like he's like you, when he stuffs him out the plane, when he gets on the helicopter, he is, he's scared. He's just evil. Like there's no, there's no like John Voight in the first one. He's a, what he is a disgruntled former employee, kills some people. He wants money, blah, blah, blah. To former IMF. It's terrible being IMF, by the way, because John Voight's a bad IMF. And then you have in the second one, Do Gray Scott's an evil IMF. And in the third one, Billy Crudup's an evil IMF. It's like, guys, oh, Henry, like, it's like MFF, uh, IMF isn't too great. Oh, no, he was like, he was like a CIA operative in Fallout. Oh, something well, like yeah, that. Yeah. And then I actually, here, I, I, I did a ton of numbers. I want to read them to you real quick. So in this movie, the word second minute in this entire franchise, the the word second minute hour and time are mentioned 226 times. And like in Fallout, they mentioned time 63 times. So like there's a reminder every 2.3 minutes of time in the Mission Impossible movies, which makes me really happy. And then in the MacGuffins are mentioned 149 times. Let's see. There's six and there's 22. There's 15 masks, 16 countries. Ethan's been disavowed by the IMF five and five times of the six films because he doesn't get disavowed in the second one. <laughs> and throughout the 12 hours, throughout the 12 hours and 51 minute running time of the franchise, Ethan spends six hours and 44 minutes on the run. So 52% of the entire franchise, he's being chased by the IMF. That's so we, funny. He's been then, fired five times, but he keeps going back to work. <laughs> he's that guy that you just can't, you can't get rid of. He just keeps showing up and they're like, at this point, he's working for free. So he hasn't collected a paycheck in like 20 years. Uh, it makes me so. And then all and then there's 17 total moments involving characters hacking alone in a van, closet, room, field, sewer or elevator shaft. And then I put R.I.P. Emilio. That's exactly what I was just thinking. That yeah. poor guy. But it, it I don't know. I, I just. I still like this. movie. I'm going to watch this movie again. And I like the crew. I look back at it and. I I I I look back at, back at it with fondness, and I like that Philip Seymour Hoffman has no, like, there's no. I'm not trying to make the world right, like the guy from Fallout. Like, I'm just uh, trying to make the world better by blowing it up and kind of. It just, I'm in my six. Now they did this to me, you know. Like, I just like that this guy's bad. He is evil, and he will. He has infinite power, and he will kill you. So oh, yeah, I mean, he he kills his own translator for messing up and getting him in trouble. Yeah, that was crazy. And it's like she had nothing to do with it. Like, how would she's just a translator? She's just there to to literally translate words between people. He's the one that fell for Maggie Q. He's the one. I guess he didn't fall for, it, but he's the one that you know got knocked out in the bathroom by Ethan Hunt. Like that was all one hundred percent his fault. He should be more upset about his big burly bodyguard not turning around mm. in the bathroom. Thirty seconds. <clears throat> <clears throat> But he's so he's so good of the entire series. Philip Seymour Hoffman is my favorite villain, and it's not even close. Yeah, I don't think, I think the that villains is, are great. No, they're not. Like that's that is my if I had one complaint with this entire series is the the villains are not memorable. No, just they kind got- of lackluster. But Owen Davian by far and away is a fantastic villain and most of it's just the acting him just straight up acting it's great but no he's backstory so, he's no he's just this evil dude that shows up 
And I mean, as Billy Kudrup says, like, you know, he's a weed. Another one's going to pop back up to just like him. But we never end up seeing anyone just like him again. Oh, he's so good. And, you know, the first one, I, I like Voight. And the second one, Dugray Scott, is just so over the top that, you know, at least he has an arc, but you're not too into it. Three, Philip T. Robinson's great. And four, not the best villain. Five, once again, just like, I'm a, Ethan, I'm going to get you. And then I knew Henry Cavill was bad from the beginning of Fallout. And then what, Isai Morales in Dead Reckoning, like, it's another bland villain. But I don't know. They they found a way around it, which is pretty interesting. They they found a good way to just I don't know. That's not the point, right? the The point is like we are we need the MacGuffin. What is the MacGuffin? Is it a knock list? Is it a rabbit foot? Is it like what is it? We need to go find it. And yeah, ends up it ends up becoming about yeah, it ends up becoming <clears throat> Ethan mission team or like Ethan MacGuffin team. Mm-hmm. And then villain is the, you know, is in the, is in the fourth pecking order for it. Like, let's get the plutonium. We need the plutonium. Like, it doesn't matter who has the plutonium. We, they just need to get the plutonium. So it's, you just got to find actors who will be like Henry Cavill and hang outside of a helicopter for months and do all that kind of crazy stuff. But like, I, I think in Dead Reckoning, there were some shocks that happened that I didn't see coming. When, when Paula Patton kicks Leah Sado out the window and kind of cold blood, you're like, whoa. Oh, Ghost Protocol. Yeah, Ghost Protocol, my bad. And like Rogue Nation, when he dies and then he has to get kind of recalibrated, that's pretty brutal as well. So it's, I don't know, I guess just threes, threes, but threes very J.J. Abrams. Like J.J. Abrams, you know, his Super 8, I I didn't really like because I just felt like it was a Spielberg knockoff. His Star Trek, first Star Trek was really good. And then Star Trek Beyond kind of crushed my soul a little Uh. bit. I love I love his Star Trek movies. Yeah, the I love first all three one of them. like like Chris Pine just explodes off the screen, and it's a really good movie that first one. But yeah, this one by a first time director with Tom Cruise with the budget they had, it's still successful and it's still fun. Like I do, like, my least favorite part is when they blow up that old school wall in the Vatican. Remember when he does that? Like there's a like oh, an yeah. ancient wall and he just blows it up. Like oh man, it's pretty. He causes so much collateral damage, <laughs> yeah, so does. much building destruction. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he, yeah, he's, uh, he doesn't care a whole lot about that stuff. But it, I, I, I still enjoy this, this movie. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about it. Cause I think it just has the most, I really think it has the most interesting. It has some very interesting things to talk about as far as like story wise and beats. And so I knew this would be a good conversation. I'm glad you disagreed with me. But, Wholeheartedly you know, disagree. But, but we're I both th- adults, though, which is kind of nice, and we can just kind of disagree. <laughs> and I, I was going to say, like, 20, almost 20 years later, like, this thing, I think this movie holds up really, really well. Like, well, it, there's some, there's some really good gadgets and tech in it, but it's not so futuristic or not. I should say it's it doesn't feel so dated. Yeah, like some of the phones, of course, are, are dated that they're using, but the gadgets that they use, you know, like you've got like the man- magnetic grenades and stuff like that, like the zip lines, you know, the pendulums. Like this is all stuff that I can still see being used today. So it doesn't feel like it's a dated movie to me when I watch it. So it's like when I watch this, I still think it could be, it could be happening like right now as we speak. Instead of watching, I don't know, like Die Hard's my all-time favorite movie. But like when you watch Die Hard, you're like, yeah, that takes place in the late 80s. Like there's no way around it. 50 years from now, that's still in the late 80s. It does not matter. Mid 90s, that thing is still in the late 80s. Like technology has advanced so fast during that point. Like for me, like it is still grounded very much in the present time. And then just literally like the effects, the CGI, the VFX, the stunt work, like yeah. all of that has held up really, really well. And a lot of that's because of Cruz. I mean, when you watch this film, like they, the bridge sequence, they filmed the bridge sequence in Virginia, but then they went and built a bridge because he's like, yeah, mm-hmm. we don't have to look at water that much. So I can build a bridge somewhere. When he's sliding down, he did that. When the truck goes over him, the truck went over him. When he's hanging outside the car, it's him hanging outside the car. So I think, you know, like even Philip Seymour Hoffman did his own work in this. When he's being dropped down an elevator after winning an Oscar for Capote, 
Like by I want to see Jonathan Reese Myers' journey just carrying Owen back. That'd be kind of oh fun. yeah. How but hard that would have been. Like, you know, they blew up the car that that Maggie Q was in. They they are they're in the boat looking awesome. Like I think most importantly, like even if you watch Mission Impossible 2, he's on that motorcycle. The blade is that close to his eye. So I think all these movies, even if they get dated because of the technology, you can still watch them over and over because it's crews in the action. Like, you know, they live. That fight scene will never get old because it's an incredible fight scene. Like, I think they just put them there, and that's why this movie's aged well. Like, I don't think Fast 8, 9, and 10 will age well because it's so much VFX. I think Fast 1, 2, and 3 age better, even 4, because they they're there or five like they actually mm-hmm. had the cars trailing the safe so i think those will age better because they did it without yeah they were, they were the able effect. to incorporate the the practical effects in and like that's the big thing especially when you're looking at these big budget visual effect movies is being able to incorporate the practical effects with the cgi and this and this movie does such a good job with it and as you mentioned like that whole bridge sequence is is really really incredible and it's like you watch it yeah like when you start to dissect the scene you really don't see the water that much outside of like the 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 big opening establishing shot and the drone coming through and then a couple times here and there it's like for the most part you don't see it a lot so like they do a really really clever job editing around that and then like you know you mentioned him you know his tribute to mission one where he repels down like the vatican wall like they filmed that yeah in two different locations and then they built that wall somewhere else so it's like it's really like they did a really really good job or like his pendulum swing like that was almost that entire building was almost all cgi mixed with a a green screen set they built like it's 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 just wonderful it, it just does a really really good job incorporating that and like the, the amount of editing they had to do, like, oh, we were we were here, we're in the Vatican, but then we can't go to the Vatican, so we gotta go build the Vatican wall outside of the Vatican, and then we have to go shoot here in this other place that's not there, and then we have to do this, and like the way that they spliced it together and the way that the VFX was added, wonderful. I mean, you look at Fast Ten, that that bridge scene that they have, it's wildly VFX. Like the the one in this one in two thousand six, that's better than that. So I think. Well, I don't I, I'm saying nothing about the technical merits of this movie. I just I don't know. I just don't I just I just don't like the idea of the kidnapped wife and then just I don't know. It's just not it's not my favorite plot line ever. But I think when it comes to third films and action franchises, I don't think it's as good as like Die Hard with a Vengeance, Ultimatum, John Wick 3, let's toss in Skyfall. I like Tokyo Drift more, but I will say it's better than Angel has fallen. I think it's probably better than Expendables three. Well, Bad Boys for Life. Like I think it's I, mid. I think it's. I think it's upper echelon third film in a franchise. I'm gonna push back a little bit on this because I don't credit. I don't count Mission Impossible two. So technically <laughs> three is the second. So now if we look at just direct, no, it sequels, doesn't work like that. Then it like ends up being <laughs> one of the best sequels. To a first movie around. Oh, gosh. I, it's better than Die Hard 2, Die Harder, which I do enjoy. You've it's better than mind. Bad Boys 2. Uh, it's better than Too Fast, Too Furious. What? You, you, all right, we're stopping this. Now, what... um, Cheater. But what... what? Okay, Tom, you. I know you got to get out here, but you can pick a crew of five Mission Impossible characters. It's you and five... No. You're watching a movie with five Mission Impossible characters throughout the entire franchise, and they're on the mission. Which five do you pick? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, like, all their age, whatever, when they're in the movie. So, like, pretend they haven't aged. And they're their characters in it. Uh, I gotta go with... I think I'd have to take Elsa, number one. Yeah, yeah. She's just so good. Yeah, she's too awesome. I would probably take... Definitely have to take Benji. I feel like Benji can almost. How, how many is so? How many do I need? Four or three? Uh, you need five total because you're five not in total. the mission. Yeah, you're just watching a movie. Okay, so it's so obviously, and that's including Ethan. No. Okay. Well, no. Then I think it's it's Elsa, Benji. I gotta take. Uh, oh, what's Jeremy Renner's name in the movie? Brant. 
Brant. Three. We need a, we need a car guy, someone to drive us in in his helicopter. And if we get into a helicopter, I'm gonna take uh, Jonathan Reese. Oh, yeah, he does some good helicopter work in this. And he was named his character was named after one of the uh, was a tribute to one of the um, I believe one of the assistant directors at one point. That's so that's fun. kind of a fun little trivia thing. That's four. I feel like. And it's probably going to be Paula Patton. I don't know. Again, like I, I like being Rames, but I also feel like, I don't know. I feel like the others can do what he's doing at times. Whoa. All right. It's like if I'm getting into a scrap and it's going sideways and it's hitting the fan, I want someone in there that can actually fight and shoot and back up. And you never really see being Rames do that. Interesting. Oh yeah, because he, he is like one hundred percent the van guy at this point. Even in what, <laughs> even in number one, he's like the van guy, and it's like he's coming off of. Ah, I don't know. Like I would have liked to see. I would have liked to see a uh, uh, diamond dog Luther Stickle instead. <laughs> All right. No. I, I, okay. Um. So. Okay. I would take Elsa, Luther, Jane, Paula Patton, Maggie Q, and then can I take the White Widow? I think she's crazy. <laughs> she's she's good. She's the she's the she's trafficker, a, right? From yeah, yeah, from the she's last two from Fallout. Yeah, she's just she's out of her mind in it. So I'm gonna is take she her. Really part of the team though, because I feel like she's just still like a bad guy. Yeah, she is, but bad she's guys like always kinda... get recruited, don't they? Yeah, I mean, I suppose they do. I guess I never truly considered her. I mean, she's part not. of the team. She's not, she's okay, like, all right, that's fair. She's like she's a not necessary a evil to get to you know to something else they're doing. Okay, so then I will take Renner because I love Born Legacy, and then he got cut out of it because because uh, Damon wanted to make another one, and so the director Justin Lin of Fast One Two th Wait No of Fast Three Four Five Six and Nine was going to direct a Born Legacy sequel, but then Damon came back. So I got Elsa, Luther, Jane, Maggie Q, and Renner. That's a good one. Yeah. Yep. We're pretty much we're pretty much right there. Nailed it. <laughs> Man, I it just that kills me when I remember when Dead Reckoning Part One, when the plot details started coming out that we would be seeing older characters reappear. I was so excited thinking that we were going to get Maggie Q and Jonathan Reese back. Like I was so pumped that there might be the possibility because they're both like in their forties still. Maggie mm -hmm. Q is like doing even more action movies now than she was twenty years ago. She was just, she just crushed it in a movie I love called The Protege. So I have not seen that yet, but it is it's on my list. Yeah, she's it's good like, in it. I I was I was so excited thinking that that was going to happen, and I and you know this. Renner had his accident around this time. So it's like you knew he was not he, he just physically couldn't even be in a movie anyways. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I don't know, maybe the accident I think probably happened after this had started filming anyways, but it's like you just knew it wasn't. It was not in the cards. It wasn't happening. I had no idea about them wanting to kill him off. I'm glad he said no, so there's still the opportunity at some point if if he wanted to if you could even physically do this stuff anymore, but this was fun. This was good. You and I normally agree pretty well. So like we got to very like adults debate the movie. And I think I still like the movie though, Tom, I just, I so don't quick, quick yeah. question about the tone of this. Cause I was reading some of the negative, negative reviews just before we go. A big knock against the movie was that it was too dark and too bleak. This one. Yeah. No. Yeah, I don't I don't know where Did they those... see the first one. <laughs> yeah, first one's like very dark. I mean, it's everyone dies. Yeah. Like that's that's one of his most famous lines screaming that they're all dead. But I mean, it's like and their deaths are bad, too. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't I don't I don't know. I just don't see. How it's so bleak and so dark, especially like. When you're com when you're comparing it to the other action movies, the spy genre movies that came out of like the Bourne trilogy and Casino Royale right before this, and also factoring in the two previous Mission Impossible, it's like 
I don't know. I just I don't see where people were upset. That's an odd one. Because this isn't dark. It's not overly bloody. It's not. I mean, I think the stuff of Philip Seymour Hoffman's intense, but whatever. He's great. But yeah, that's an odd. That's an odd one. Yeah, I don't know. I, I wish I, I wish I had something for you. I there. mean, I mean, yeah. If people are upset that it was that it was bleak, can you imagine what movie we would have gotten if David Fincher had <laughs> gone through and directed this? The killer. He would never. I, I don't know. Would he and Tom Cruise work together well? Because Fincher is very methodical. And nowadays, um, I don't know. I mean, can you can you imagine this Mission Impossible with Fincher? It'd be like a mix of Girl with a Dragon Tattoo and Seven, like, because <laughs> I, I know at one point one of the early one of the early drafts for this movie it was supposed to be about harvesting body organs on like the black market and then like shutting that down. Uh, I don't know. Dark. I don't know if that was Fincher's take, but it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, that's not it. Right? That's not. Jeez Louise. No. I mean, yeah, like this could have gone like really, really dark. Real quick, though. So I guess, you know, Cruz did work with Kubrick and Paul Thomas Anderson, and he dealt with them just fine. And Kubrick had them do 100 plus takes, but he was making a kubrick movie kubrick wasn't making a mission impossible movie does that make sense so i don't know how fincher would have worked out in that and there's nothing wrong with what fincher does i mean he's methodical and you and i know it man like getting the camera set up is the biggest job then you have the actors there you can do a bunch of takes and you're fine especially if you budget for it so i don't blame him for that but that'd be i don't know if that would work for a mission impossible it would definitely be tough for the action sequences because those aren't something or like the stunt work that's not something you can just uh roll back and repeat often yeah Cruz would be like stop I, I can only get blown into this so many times yeah it would it would literally kill him <laughs> but i guess you know i guess that's kind of why they do some of the big stunts first up and i remember him saying what was it was it with uh is it fallout where he's on the outside of the airplane yeah that was crazy they did that like their first big they may have done that like day one or two and then Cruz jokingly said like let's get it over with early so if i die you're not wasting months <laughs> dude the guy is he is something else yeah he is he's next level he really is like the guy he's he's all about making cinema like when you listen to him speak he wants to understand worldwide audiences he wants to understand what makes movies work and i think he's always evolving so it's fun to talk about his career because you see the evolution you see him evolve and the, i mean the guy has been making hits since the 80s so i've had to go through all of his movies and pull his running scenes his hanging scenes I've watched, I've watched so many of his movies. I've watched all of his shirtless scenes. I've counted how many motorcycles. I've counted how many times he's held his breath in movies. Is he the, is he the, uh, the ultimate A-lister at this point? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't like, you know, I know Chalamet has had a couple big hits, but I think he's the last of kind of the eighties, nineties breed where Will Smith is in a movie. Adam Sandler's in a movie. Jim Carrey's in a movie. Julia Roberts is in a movie. Denzel's in a movie. I think Denzel's still around because the Equalizer's still making money. But yeah, he's 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 the one of the few. Sandra Bullock's doing pretty great too. But yeah, I would say he's one of the the last standing A listers from that heyday. Yeah, because I feel like every movie he's making is still a big event. Yeah, you know, and I I think Dead Reckoning it came out on the tail end of the pandemic barbenheimer and so like it in it you know it kind of got hit but box office wise it did not do as well as it wanted to especially considering the giant inflated budget that it had Ugh. yeah and so it, that, that's kind of the biggest knock to it but i mean like it's still an event like it is the type of movie you want to see in theaters where like the other names that you've listed eh, I, I don't know if that's necessarily those aren't movies that are drawing me to the theaters to see no uh like he's still doing it he's do he's putting himself through this for worldwide audiences like yeah he, yeah he he studies he wants that's why 
Mission Impossible is so good. No, I'm sorry. That's why Top Gun Maverick is so good. I mean, a billion dollars legacy sequel that appeals to fans of the original, but then also appeals to like new fans. Yeah, he's smart. Cruz is smart. Here, here's here's crossing the fingers and hoping for for Edge of Tomorrow sequel. Oh, I still haven't talked about that. I would love to talk about that on the show. The problem with that one is it's just good. So you and I would just be talking about how good it is the entire we time. We would be. Which I don't it know could, if it's it, that interesting. It could be it could be a 30 second podcast just saying it's good over and over yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I, just a it's a quick one hitter. You know, it's funny. I gave examples of uh, I, I couldn't think of any specific examples, but that's one of those where you're just like that movie's awesome. It would just be us talking about how awesome it is. So you and I debated a little bit here. That was fun. All right. Well, hey, Tom, I know you got to get out of here. So thank you very much for joining me. And what we're doing a 2004 draft next, correct? Yes, we are. Oof. You know, that 94, 99, and 2004 are my, my favorite personal movie years. Not exactly according to like movie quality, but just my experiences in the theaters and the stories I have. So I'm excited to talk to you about that. I, I started making a list the other day. And yeah, there's some of my all-time favorite favorite movies, some of my big disappointments and some of my at least up until that point i was in high school but like uh one movie that stands out is like my most anticipated movie of all time came out that year and i actually have its poster hanging up here in my bonus room what is it oh no save it wait what is it Uh, do you want me to say it save it save it for the pod all right i'll save it for the i'll save it for our draft oh that'll be good i'm excited it's probably going to be my number one and it's not even my favorite movie from that year, unfortunately. It's just I was so wrapped up and waiting for it. Was it one of the... No, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I don't think it's going to shock you when I when I tell you. Just tell me now. Troy. Oh, wow! I watched that. So, for, so I got I to gotta go here in a minute, but before yeah, we yeah. go, anybody that, that, that is a big uh, novel reader, read Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield fantastic book about the battle of Thermopylae. So like I was huge into that's kind of when I got into like sword and shield fantasy. It's not a fantasy. It's a, it's a historical fiction, but like that type of genre of, of books and even movies. And so it's like, you know, Lord of the Rings came out, but like I got big into reading at that point. And it's a really, really good book about the battle of Thermopylae and like the last uh, the 300 Spartans for people that know that story and so then it's like all of a sudden you get Wolfgang Peterson and Troy coming at me you know like right after I read this book and I was just so amped for it for two or three years oh, just waiting for this thing and then yeah you know then it, it is what it is and I didn't live up to what I had in my mind but there's a lot to still enjoy about it We'll talk off air because I know you got to get out of, get out of here. But I got some funky picks, so I might message you them, so you might have a chance to watch them. So I'm not just dropping weird movies on you. Okay. All right. This is good. Well, hey, thank you for joining me, Tom. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. All right. So for me, Mark Hoffmeyer, for Tom Tresemer, this is Movie Sons of Flicks. We'll see you next week. <laughs>